Hey everybody, welcome back to another Sales Hacker live event where we really appreciate that you're choosing the hour to spend with us and thanks so much for joining. Um, it's your first time, you picked a good one. We've got Dale Dupree sharing his expertise on how to delight prospects to improve conversion at every stage of the pipeline. Uh, Air call, customer centricity is the heart of everything they do. They're re redefining the experience one call at a time. From personalization to streaming the sales process, building integrations to create bridges for a seamless experience, driving growth, and more. As we give everybody a few minutes to roll in, go ahead and go down to your chat box. Make sure it's turned to everyone, not just hosts and panelists. Tell us your name, your role, and where you're tuning in from. Maybe drop your LinkedIn profile if you want. Oh, and give a shout out to Dale and his wife, Shauna, because today is actually their 15th wedding anniversary. So that's pretty cool that he's able to, to spend some time with us. Um, we love to keep things super interactive. So talk with other attendees. It's one of the fun aspects of having and joining live. Um, if you have any questions at any point, throw it in the Q&A box so it doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, another thing that I'm super pumped for um, is our Sales Hacker Roadshow. Uh, we just opened up registration. I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, it's our first of the year in-person community events. We're going to Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and London. We'll eat, drink, network together, and share some research about what makes a high-performing rep in 2022, because we all know it's different than it used to be. Um, you'll also discuss that with your peers. Um, so we've got about 50 spots available in each city, sometimes some sometimes less, so make sure you res, uh, RSVP. Um, on to the man of the hour. Dale, thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to inter introduce yourself and dive in. Well, thanks, Savannah. I appreciate everybody at Sales ha Hacker for having me. Shout out to my boy, Mikey. Um, uh, just so everybody knows, Mikey is sick. So say a little prayer for Mikey. Hope you're feeling better, bro. I miss you today. Uh, but I'm grateful to Sales Hacker for trusting me enough to like let me run my own masterclass without any help. So I feel like an adult. It's freaking cool. <laughs> if you don't know me, my name is Dale Dupree. I'm affectionately formerly known as the Copier Warrior. I brought the Copier Warrior with me today for this masterclass uh, because we're going to be talking about how to bring joy and happiness and fun back into sales. I'm really excited about this topic in general. Um, and so a little bit about myself. I started selling copiers back in 2007. Prior to that, I was playing in a band on Warner Brothers Records um, and was a full-time musician, doing my thing, playing music for a bunch of strangers every night. And really, I was learning sales at that point in my life. Little did I know. Um, and really, just to mention it to everybody here, I believe that life is sales, y'all. Uh, and I love this question. It's my favorite one that I always get. What's up, Adam? I sang for the band, uh, but I definitely played some other instruments. It would be debatable how well I played those other instruments, but I thought I played them pretty good. Um, my dad actually got me started on the guitar, played the piano when I was uh, younger. To get to the guitar, you know, you had to like do the step ladder. Like mom and dad would be like, sure, you want to? You want to play some loud heavy metal music? You've got to start with the harp and the xylophone because <laughs> they're not as loud in the house, right? So just been a musician kind of all my life because of that. So appreciate that question, man. It is good to reminisce on being a vocalist. But of course, you guys already knew I was a vocalist. I'm a talker. I don't stop and I'm in sales, right? So think about this for a second, y'all. Prior to this jumping into this commodity industry and being told that I had to bang doors and smash the phone and hit a quota, every single night I had a bunch of strange people in a room in front of me that I had to convince to be able to listen to my music, right? To stay, to buy stuff afterwards. And what was interesting is that that's how I saw it in my head that I was trying to convince people. But what I slowly realized over time is that it's really influence that's the most powerful word and and um, and, and also uh, subject in, inside of sales, influence. I would rather influence people than convince them anyway, right? I'd like them to make up their own mind. 
is is the thought process there. So as I as I was developing this influential um, concept inside of my music career, when I started my B two B sales career, I realized that man, ain't nobody in sales really think like I did when I was a musician and I was building my business over there. And I'm confused. I'm not sure why this is. However, I kind of just followed the flow and thought. Maybe this is how you become successful in business. Disconnect from the things that you might feel are better and learn this mechanical way inside of the sales world. Excuse me. My wife got me some cookies for our anniversary. Shout out to, to my girl, Shauna. She's the best. One of them was a Snickers cookie. I told Savannah the story. Maybe I'll tell one of y'all later, but I got a little bit of the burps happening. So I apologize. What a masterclass this is, y'all. Come on now. Right? Sales hackers like, Jesus, we're never letting Dale do anything again as they watch this. So back to my story. I started to slowly recognize in the process of like becoming mechanical and very robotic in sales around this process-driven concept of making calls, pitching people, setting appointments, closing deals. I started to realize that people didn't like that, um, even if it worked. Okay, And, and I watched it work for other people um, around me as well, too. Right. Uh, but I didn't like it personally. And I felt like there's better ways to do things. And really, in my head, what I thought was that, hey, I wonder if anybody has ever like taken the risk to try this. I wonder if ever, anybody has ever tried to be a little bit more human, a little bit more authentic, a little less pitchy and separate themselves from this concept of sales and the box that has been created by so many and mostly just the status quo over time. And like a flash of lightning, things changed. I developed the brand of the copier warrior. I started to lead with love, uh, with curiosity, um, with causing curiosity, I should say as well too, uh, with giving people experiences instead of a pitch, uh, what with putting community at the forefront and culture at the forefront of what it is that I was building and not a sales career. And because of that, <clears throat> what happened for me uh, which could happen for all of you as well, too, uh, was almost immeasurable. Uh, and what's up, Daniel? Uh, you got your one-year-old son, man. What's up, hey, buddy? How's it going? What's his name, man? You got to tell me his name. I got a four-year-old. Maybe they can hang out sometimes, sell copy machines when they get older. It'll, it'll be great. Benedict, what's up, man? Nice to meet you. So I digress. Because of those things, by about 2010, 2011, my sales career was taking off. I was breaking all the records inside of my organization, doing all the things that the higher ups essentially would, you know, would be happy uh, that you're doing as a sales rep. And none of you really care about that anyway, right? W what really matters is are the lessons that I was able to teach myself, that I'm able to teach all of you today. Because if I can create extrinsic value through my experiences, everything changes, right? For the trajectory of your life and your sales career. Um, and someone did it for me. I want to mention that as I as I get to the end of my story here. Uh, but first, let me just also say that my company that I was with was acquired in 2012. In 2012, the company that I went to was an eight million dollar firm. We took them to 25 million by 2016, 17. Sorry, it was a blast. Right? Imagine that kind of growth in that short a time. I we went from like 40 employees to 150. It was crazy. Um, one of the most amazing experiences in my life. I love the culture there. I love the people there. It really propped me up for success. Ended up going to a larger organization, a um, publicly traded company called Xerox, helping with their sales department and branch in the Orlando, Florida area, which is where I'm born and raised. Um, and I slowly realized that I could be doing more to impact the sales community uh, if I would just get out of my comfort zone. Um, and stop worrying so much about working for other people and also worrying so much about whether or not I was going to be able to be successful on my own in the first place. Yes, everyone, a guy like Dale Dupree uh, struggles with self-doubt. <laughs> Crazy thought, right? I think we all do, though, uh, which is a big piece of the puzzle of, of what makes our community so unique, right, as salespeople, because every day we're faced with those types of thoughts, because we're literally staring down them um, all the time. Uncertainty, 
the the identity of challenging yourself on a daily basis, risking for reward, right? Sales is not easy, right? But it's a calling, but it's also something that I believe we do on a daily basis. Remember earlier when I talked a little bit about selling as a musician? Well, how many of y'all have tried to sell your parents on, you know, a later curfew when you were younger or anything like that, right? I believe that sales is, is inherently in all of us, the way we communicate with one another. And I don't think it's a dirty word. I think it's natural. And I think it's a piece of the puzzle that if we fine tune correctly to accommodate people and to build communities, I believe that we can have the, some of the most successful lives that any generation or anybody in mankind has ever seen in the history of this world. It's a crazy thought, right? We can do it. Let's go rebels. So enough about me. I started the sales rebellion. That's what I'm doing today. That's what I'm here to talk to you about a little bit today. Some of the, the ways that we handle prospects anywhere inside of the sales cycle or our pipeline, um, how we, we bring and infuse love and curiosity into the process and just bring joy, general sense of joy back to who it is that we seek to serve. Um, so let's jump into it. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the person that influenced all this right off the bat, which is my father, Curtis Dupree. My dad was amazing at sales, one of the best. He was the original Dwight Schrude, uh, as we like to say. He started his job in the copier world as well, too, uh, his career in the copier world as well, too. Um, after blowing out his knees uh, in, at Carson Newman University on a football scholarship, he came back into the copier industry and started by selling paper. Do I? <laughs> What's up? I never forget the first time I was watching The Office and I was like, look at this. This is my dad, the man, the myth, the legend. So, and, there, and, and by the way, my dad was nothing like Dwight, just like a legendary salesperson, right? So very extroverted, filled with love. My father hit the market, made a great reputation for himself so much so that he was able to start his own business. And in the process of what he built for 29 years, my dad had customers that stayed with him from day one. All right. So imagine being a, a young child and growing up uh, with a father who is who is leading, not from the front or from the back, but locked in arm to arm, shoulder to shoulder with every single person, not just inside of his company, but that he served inside of the community. It was pretty wild uh, to experience, um, especially as I got older and I realized what my father had built and created success around and how most people would tell you that, that that that's a dead end, that nice guys finish last, which is a myth, something that people want you to think is the truth so that you don't tap into your full potential. And so I'm here to dispel those things and also to teach everybody a little bit more about the concepts that we're talking about. So let's, let's talk about the first uh, bullet point that I had here that Mikey was going to you know, very eloquently walk us into, but I'm just going to jump right into it because I'm not eloquent at all. Although my mom does say that I'm like a gazelle, right? She, I've heard her say that. Shout out to my mom. Some people will call me a bull in a china shop. My mom's like, no, Dale's a gazelle. I don't know what that means, guys. But um, if you call me a gazelle at any point in my comment section on any of my LinkedIn posts, I'll laugh really hard. So shout out to the first person that makes that happen. Let's make sales fun for everyone. Here's the thing about that, that I think is important, that if we want to instill happiness, if we want to bring joy back to sales cycles, we have to understand that we have to love what we do. And so maybe you sell something that, that that's not so sexy or that's not something that people desire to sell in the first place. Can you imagine what happened when I went from a music career to telling people that I was going to be selling copy machines, especially my peers and my friends, right? Can you imagine what kind of things they said? What? You're going to be doing what, dude? Like copy machines? <laughs> what even is that? Do we use copiers still? Right? And this is the year 2022. I bet a bunch of you are like, is that still a thing? Yes, it absolutely, it absolutely is. Thank you, Donna. I'm smiling. I'm laughing on the inside too. Gazelles. <laughs> I should ask my mom what that is. This is a good reminder. I'm gonna make it note real quick. Mom, what's a what do you mean by that? So if we if we want to have fun in sales, if we want to instill joy in other people. We have to connect with ourselves and why it is that we're selling this thing. Okay, I can't 
connect with a copy machine. I'm sorry, y'all. I tried really hard, but I, I could never quite connect with a copy machine. You want to know how I connected with a copy machine when I saw one in the window as I walked past? Because I did a lot of door knocking. I, I was on the phone a lot as well, but I did a lot of door knocking face to face. So I'm walking, imagine you're walking down a strip and you see a copy machine. I didn't think to myself, ooh, I'm going to go in here and try to sell something. I used to, th I used to think of my dad. And I still do to this day. If I'm, <laughs> imagine walking down a downtown district and I look in a real estate office and there's a copy sit, copier sitting there, I, I think of my father. I connected to the things that my dad built. And I would say to myself, ooh, there's not just a copier in here. There's an opportunity for me to make the lives of these people more fruitful because I can make their business better by serving them and by, and by leading with that heart of a servant leader to begin with. And how do I do that? Right. Do I go in and I, and I just, hi, I'm Dale and I'm with this company and I'd like to sell you a copier and build a relationship with you. And it kind of sounds creepy. <laughs> it really does actually. <laughs> so instead I, I decided, well, what would be fun for other people as well too? Nobody likes getting cold called. There's nobody on this call. Like you can say all you like that. Oh yeah. I love picking up cold calls. Like I do too. I freaking love picking them up too. They are obnoxious guys and girls. Most people don't know how to do it. Right. A lot of the times it's clunky. A lot of the times it hurts to listen to, especially when you have knowledge of doing them and you know, you know <laughs> what it's like to do an effective one and you're listening going, Oh God, I want to just stop this person and tell them how to do this and then buy from them because I'm going to sell myself in the process, right? Nobody likes a cold call, right? Because nobody likes to be sold something. And I started to apply those concepts to this identity. And so there's three things in particular that I did, and I'm going to talk about them right now. One is that I would interrupt the typical patterns. So this is a crazy thought. And I, uh, I don't know that I've ever actually told this one uh, on a, on a call like this, but I used to, I used to actually pop my collar, one side of my collar and I would unbutton, you know, a button right here in the middle and like put it, you know, reverse it. So it was all weird looking and, and I would like roll one sleeve up and maybe hike, uh, up, up my short or my uh, long sleeve pants a little bit and take a shoe off and hold it in my hand and walk in and do a cold call. And all of you are like trying to visualize that right now. That's the power of storytelling, by the way. I just want to mention that it's a huge piece of the puzzle of what we're doing by creating fun and joy for people inside of an experience that we're giving by interrupting their typical patterns is we're also creating stories in these moments, which people can identify with and that activate the brain in a way that a cold call never can. And so imagine that you see me walk in like that. What are you going to say to me? Most people would say it way quicker, say something to me way quicker than I could to them. Are you okay? Can I, can I help you? Do you need help? <laughs> Types of things that people would say to me. Pretty amazing, right? Think about that for just a second as a salesperson. Imagine that you're calling people and they're like, can I help you? Like genuinely, not just like, what can I do for you today? <laughs> genuinely asking if they can help. And I would, I would, roll into my acting career. That's when I started my acting career, ladies and gentlemen, when I was doing cold calls and I would like heavy breathe. <sighs> yes, you can. Actually, I just got out of your neighbor's office. And uh, if I tell you why I'm in here, do you promise not to, to throw me out like they did? And the person would just start laughing like almost immediately. They would, <laughs> they would recognize what was happening. They'd be like, you're insane. Right. But, and sometimes I got to finish the story, you know, or I got to tell people like, yeah, I just, I told the people next door what it was that I, that I do for a living and they, they beat me up. Right. And most people could identify with that and they could, they could empathize. Right. Because I, what's crazy is most people out there that are in an office environment, they understand sales, even if they'd never done it. They've had a cold call happen to them. They've, they have done an internship somewhere. Right, where they had to do some kind of marketing or send emails. And so they, they understand to some extent, most people do. Okay. Now I want you to remember that. So we're creating familiar moments uh, when we interrupt typical patterns in a way that provides relevance. Okay. And I put that in quotes because we're going to get that a little bit later. I think relevance can be uh, overplayed by people. And I think that familiarity is a much more powerful emotion 
to make people feel. So in those moments, I'm not just typical interrupting the typical patterns. I'm giving an experience. Okay. None of you that are listening to this right now would dare do the stuff that I just did. That's a challenge, by the way. <laughs> Anybody out there that's a high D personality that's like, a bet? You want to bet, my guy? Like, I'm in, right? Let's go, Adam. So join the Rebel Slack and tell us about all the stories of you doing really cool cold calls like that. But what I did is I created the crumpled letter technique. If any of you have ever heard of it, it's uh, you've probably heard of it as the infamous crumpled letter. And so <laughs> loved your work. And it's always sunny. What's up, Steven? That's what's up. So the crumpled letter technique, it was less uh, having to pop my collar um, and less having to put on this act and more giving the experience in a very, very familiar way for the person that I was cold calling. So I made it less about myself over time and made it more about my prospects. And what the crumpled letter was, was either a balled up piece of paper, or I put it in a mini trash can, or I had it in a sealed envelope that said crumpled letter on a big red envelope or some bright color. And I would hand that to the person at the front desk and say, could you get this to the boss for me? So whether that was Steve or it was Lauren, I would just ask them to basically get it to the person in charge, right? Now, data uh, companies sucked back then. I just want to say that. Shout out to all the ones that are in existence today, especially Lead IQ. We love those guys. Uh, sorry if I'm not allowed to be plugging people like that on here, by the way, sales hacker. Air call is better than anybody else. How's that? Does that make up for it? Get air call if you don't have it. Uh, love air call. There we go. There's three three times. <laughs> so the crumpled letter technique, not only did it interrupt patterns, right, but it gave people very familiar experiences. People would say, what is this, right? Or they would read it and the first paragraph would say, hey, you're probably wondering why this letter is crumpled up. 99% of the sales uh, marketing and tools or tactics that, that happen here in regards to brochures, white papers, whatever, usually end up in the trash. So I pre-crumpled this letter to make it easier for you to throw away because I value your time. And I want to build a partnership that starts at that foundation of me helping you to understand just how much I care. Uh, so I condensed that, obviously. It was a you know much different way um, to, to put that to people. There is a much different way to put that to people, I should say, in less words, right? So inside of good experiences and inside of interrupting typical patterns, we also have to be very concise and we have to we have to be good stewards of other people's time in those moments as well too. So if someone sees this giant scroll type letter with all this these words and no breaks and no white space, it's intimidating, right? So you have to think very, very, very with the mindset of excellence around the things that you do when you're giving people experiences as well, too. And so think about this, everybody. Not only were we having fun and what it is that we were doing, but we were making sales fun for other people that had to that had to feel things like a cold call. So imagine government entities, purchasing departments have to talk to vendors no matter what. Well, we make it fun to talk to vendors. And imagine that we we graduated from crumpled letters to also creating sequences of paper airplane letters, <laughs> coffee stain letters, pre-burnt letters, as we called them, um, and didn't just try to rely on one hit or quitter concepts. Now imagine inside of a, a nurturing sequence that you have this momentum that you can create where someone says, sure, I, you know, great marketing. I need six months before I even consider talking to you again. Well, what are you going to do over the next six months? You know, what kind of experiences are you going to give? These ideas should help you effectively come up with some concepts around the experiential portion. We're going to talk more about how to build value out of these things, both extrinsically and intrinsically as well, too. But let's get to the next bullet point, which is the art form of sales. And I think most of you are hearing what I'm saying, and you're understanding that sales isn't just a science. It's an art. And, and art is beautiful. <laughs> Remember that there are imperfections in art, though, as well, too. And that, that art is, it can be abstract. It can be something that that is risky and might like feel not all there or together for you as the person that's performing said art. But remember that people deserve your authenticity, right? And people deserve you to be all in when you show up. So one of the first things that I find to be most effective inside of the art form of sales is the concept of active listening. Imagine that I'm giving you these experiences and that I'm in this, this cycle with you 
you're most likely sharing a lot of information with me, right? Hey, I'm, I'm, I don't normally do this. That's you 90% of the time. That's what people would say. <laughs> I don't normally talk to salespeople. I don't normally give this information out, which is a great response, right? We want to, we want to get, um, engage those responses. We want to create those responses through this concept. Um, but imagine that those people would then kind of just tell you like what was going on. And most salespeople take that as data to put in the CRM and to use it for the sale. Me, I see it as content. <laughs> so when I see four paragraphs of four different subjects that this person's talking about, how busy they are in time, uh, the product that they're currently using and when it's up, you know, and when they're, they'll reevaluate said product, et cetera, et cetera. When I look at that, I look at it as content, y'all. And that's how all of you should shift your mindset is that I'm actively listening and I'm taking these things as content and I'm breaking them down. And I'm regurgitating exactly what this person is telling me, whether it's verbally, through an email, doesn't matter. I'm creating something that is much more personal to those people because I'm really listening. And I'm, I'm talking about really listening, folks. I'm not, talking about, <laughs> I'm not talking about somebody saying, yeah, I'm not happy with my product and that's all you hear, right? I'm talking about all the micros behind those moments. Okay. And which leads to the power of nurturing, because now if I have all this content, right, y'all call it data. I'm a rebel. I call it content, right? I can nurture that sale and because it's not a sale, y'all. It's a human. <laughs> and if I'm nurturing this human being through this process, that's typically robotic through the, the concept of, of it being more of an art form, I am awakening something in people that they didn't know existed. And now suddenly they like salespeople. Well, they like this one at least, right? Which is okay. It's okay if they just, they, they favor us in those moments <laughs> over other salespeople. But that's why the rebellion even exists to begin with. We are here to dismantle the stereotypes that have been put on salespeople to begin with. And it's, it's all of your uh, job because <laughs> I can't do it by myself to go out there and through daily habits and through concepts like this to literally make it so. This is the concept also of building on credibility and trust. So if we're creating this art form out of this concept of making sales fun for people, what is happening, right? People are now suddenly changing the way that they think about us there and there's credibility and trust being built. Okay. I'm not, uh, and here's the one thing I want to say is that I'm not saying that people are suddenly going to just like you. Okay. Credibility and trust are much different than someone liking you. All right. So you might, you might still get kind of like this cold feeling from the people you're talking to. Right. I hear it all the time from sales reps, right? Like, you know, it's strange. It's so, like this stuff is working, but also like there's some people that just kind of stay kind of sour through the process, but they buy, right? Well, that's that's because we are formulating around the concept of credibility and trust. Those are the things that are most important inside of sales. You don't need to be liked by everybody. Matter of fact, there was numerous times that I dropped off a crumpled letter and people were like, this is stupid. Don't take that personally, right? Just like when they read your email and they don't respond because they think this isn't worth my time. Don't take offense to that. Think about how you can be better in those moments. Think about, okay, cool. So this doesn't, this crumpled letter doesn't, it's not fun for this person. <laughs> it's not bringing joy back to the sales cycle. It's, it's definitely not translating the art form of sales for myself either. So like, I need to think about this. What would be something that would catch this person's attention based on the feedback that they gave me about this crumpled letter, because I'm actively listening. And I don't just hear that it sucks, right? I hear that there are things that are keeping me from breaking through to this person through something like lighthearted humor, right? Well, that makes sense to everybody. But really, what you, again, what you're thinking about is how do I accommodate other human beings? That's where the art form comes into play drastically. How do I accommodate other human beings? How do I give them experiences that are memorable? Well, guess what? When someone doesn't like your crumpled letter or your six foot cardboard cutout of yourself stabbing a copy machine, they'll never forget you because you're not indifferent. So seek out emotional responses from people, good or bad, right? Never be indifferent. Those are the building blocks of credibility and trust. I bet you didn't think I was going to say that. <laughs> Let's jump to the next bullet point. Leading with relevance and familiarity over products and services. Sharon, you're awesome, by the way. Thank you for being here. 
um, really stoked that you got to be here for as long as you did. Thank you for the great dialogue. And you're right. Some people do not have a sense of humor and that's okay. We love them anyway. So let's talk about this concept of what is, why is relevance and familiarity so much more powerful than a product and a service? Let's break that down. If you walk in and tell somebody, hi, I sell copy machines, they already have a copier. What do you think their response is going to be? Great. I got one of those. Thank you. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you walk in and you say, hi, I help with document workflows. <laughs> this is something that's like a hot button in some uh, uh, of the, uh, the companies inside of my old industry. I help with document management and workflows. That's just going to confuse people, right? There really is no relevance or familiarity in those moments, right? And if any of us who have been in the working world understand one thing, it's that if a company says, hey, we're going to go paperless and everything's going to be digital, that yeah, sometimes that works for sure. But for the most part, there's always still gaps, right? And so when you're, when you're talking about something that's very generic and not meeting the gaps, right, and not trying to find those moments of clarity that create familiarity and relevance, then we're just selling a product or a service using some stupid pitch or line that somebody made up in our industry that's been retired from even knocking on doors for the last 15 years to begin with. Don't listen to those people. Trust your heart. Trust what it is that your prospect needs to hear, not what a guru is telling you, including myself. Although I am still actively in the field for all of you that are sitting there saying like, look at you talking smack about yourself, Dale. No, I was just in the field last week or two weeks ago in Atlanta door knocking. So for real. I love door knocking, y'all. So the, the point is, is that we have to make sure that we're not using industry standards around talk tracks and things that are irrelevant to our customer because our, our industry said this will work, right? How? Why? How do you know? What customer told you that that's a thing, right? Just because you sat in a boardroom with a bunch of people and made this stuff up doesn't mean that it's fact. Sorry to anybody that this offends. I don't care. I'm a rebel. So think about this. Nobody cares about what you're selling. They care about the problems that you can fix. You cannot get to the problems that you can fix for somebody by just poking out a whole bunch of pain points either, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't work like it used to potentially back in the 1980s to begin with, 1990s even. At this stage in the game, you have to create familiar moments for people. You have to storytell around the guy and be the guide around the things that are happening inside of somebody's office in order for them to connect with you, right? Otherwise, what you're saying is just white noise. There is no joy in that. There is no experience in that. There is no nurturing effect in that. There is nothing curious about it, and it doesn't interrupt the typical patterns. Hopefully, that ties everything in very well for everybody listening. The other side is, is that familiar moments can create a personalized feeling. So if right now what we're doing to create personalization, doing some research on the company, checking out their website, and then getting on the phone with them and regurgitating all the stuff they already know. Hey, I read your, your mission statement and I see that these are some of the things that you align with. While effective in the past and maybe still effective for some of you listening today, your customer is not instilled a sense of wonder in those moments. They're just like, cool, you read our bio. Let's be honest, y'all. Sure, it might make them feel a little bit better about your sales call than somebody else's because they didn't give them any type of effort, <laughs> right? But let's remember the client, right? More so than let's try to use this move to get a meeting, right? So if we create familiar moments for people, right? Instead of trying to personalize our talk tracks to them, then we create dialogue. All right. So, like, let's say that we've got somebody for, uh, uh, particular that we're calling on in an industry where inside of those businesses that we're calling is pretty standard. They're at the front desk. There's usually a line of people because they're in retail or some kind of commerce, but they have to pick up the phone when it dials. Why would you say something like, hey, this is Dale. How are you? Right? Why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say, "Hey, it's Dale. I know there's probably a line of people standing in front of you right now, and you're and you're probably wondering why the heck would I take a sales call at this moment?" But listen, I'm not selling uh, timeshares, and I'm not calling about your car's extended warranty. So, would you give me a minute to radically educate you about what I do and how I think we can be a partner with your business, or are you ready to hang up the phone? 
right? Interrupt the patterns, be something that stands out and personalize around the moment that somebody's feeling. Hey, this guy gets it. He knows I'm busy. <laughs> if I call it lunch, I know you'll be in the break room, but is there an extension uh, to the phone line in there? Or do you guys get, did you get rid of the phones and they're all together so nobody can do any work while they're eating? I get it if that's the case. When we create talk tracks around personalization, all it needs to be is a familiar moment for people. Everybody listening right now knows that if they fixed a problem for, let's just say, attorneys, you sell to attorneys, you fixed a problem inside of one of their processes that your software, your solution, your service overcomes, that the next attorney probably has similar issues and the next and the next and the next and the next. This is how we create familiar moments for people. When we know what people go through and when we call it out as less of a, I fix these problems and more of a, are you experiencing these things? Is this happening right now? This allows people to literally vent in the moment, which brings a sense of happiness, believe it or not. Psychology tells us that when we get things off our chest, we feel better, right? So when we're looking at the way that the brain reacts to a question or to a statement, and we try to tie emotion into that, then we're hitting this familiar feeling every single time, like the best target practice you ever had. The other side of this is that I want you to remember that relevance is just a word, okay? Familiarity and feelings they provide a captive moment for people. So we want to think relevance is important. Don't hear me playing that now. Okay. Just don't think of it as the end all be all to what you're trying to produce for people in those moments, especially when you're trying to bring some sense of fun back to the sales process. Because a lot of the time relevance will be, it'll, it'll be around a particular subject that people don't want to deal with. Hey, listen, I would love to fix those problems, but I have 99 other ones. And there's the, and most of them take precedence over what you're calling about. I don't have time for you. Call me in six months, right? Just because you're relevant doesn't mean you're gonna you're not gonna be met with that type of objection in the first place. So apply that and think about how I create familiar moments for people so that even in the midst of being busy, I can create dialogue. I can build on a, and nurture a relationship that leads to credibility and trust. It's okay if they don't like you. <laughs> so let's talk about the next bullet point, which. Being pleasantly persistent to convert more of these meetings, right? I want everybody to raise their right hand and solemnly swear that I will never send an email again saying just checking in. That phrase is dead. It does not help you inside of your sales career. Does it give you results every once in a while? Absolutely. Okay. Everything works, right? Anybody that says that, no that nothing works at period is wrong. Being dead and working are two different things. <laughs> Right. I want you to remember that. So I'm not telling you not to do it because it doesn't work. I'm telling you not to do it because people don't freaking like it, ladies and gentlemen. Why not do something that people are attracted to? This is what brings life back to the sales cycle. Instead, create intrinsic or extrinsic value in those moments. So instead of checking in, I talked earlier about all this content that we can create from people's own mouths. Right. When someone tells you they're busy, send them a calendar of the entire fiscal year and, and put like in all of the days. Right. Because you've got 30 ish per month. Right. On average. And put in all the days like oh, I'm doing yoga today. I can't talk on December 17th of 2023. But the following day on the 18th, I have some time. I know it's a while out, but you said you were really busy. So I just wanted to kind of get on your calendar at some point. These are the moments that we can create. For people and what through that content that we gather from people. I remember, and I actually mentioned this yesterday to a rep I was in the field with doing some training. I remember somebody telling me that their plate was full, and I remember getting them an <laughs> empty plate uh, with the Copier Warrior logo on it and telling them as soon as they want to get rid of that plate that's full and jump to this empty plate, I'm waiting here to fix the problems with their equipment, right? That, that this person had multiple times expressed to me, right? So we have to think about. That intr the intrinsic value that that provides. That's not just a pattern interrupt in that moment. That's not just something that's funny. It also aligns with people's values of, of like, man, this person cares. Holy crap. What a concept, ladies and gentlemen. This person actually cares. They went out of their way to do something like this for me. <laughs> Thanks, Laura Beth. Maybe that's what she meant all these years. It gives me hope. <laughs> so 
the concept here is when we hear people tell us things, we can turn that into content. My sales team is having these issues, right? Can you imagine when someone tells me something like that, what happens, right? We send them videos with, with all kinds of advice. We don't send, Hey, just checking in. We say, Hey, here's two things you can do with your team. We don't, we don't say it's been a month since you've responded to any of my messages. <laughs> we just continue the process of building the relationship, nurturing that trust and credibility and giving the type of value that people deserve through experiences that are much better than just checking in. All right. So this is the concept of nurturing a business relationship instead of forcing it. When people see things like, what'd you think per my last email? <laughs> Would you, did you have any ch a chance to think over my proposal? That's forcing things. Like, let it be more natural for people. People get busy. You get just as busy. How many people are waiting on you to make a freaking decision in your life, right? I always, say, I always tell people to ask themselves those questions. Put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're calling on right now. Right. And you're sitting here complaining, God, I've hit, I'm hitting them up like four times in the last three weeks. They told me that they were going to make a decision like 10 days ago. Well, Lord have mercy. Like, think about how busy you are. <laughs> Imagine that someone called you right now and wanted to talk. You can't talk. You're with me. We're doing all this work. How the heck are you going to, are you going to help them? Right. They're, they're no different than you. And that's the thing that you've got to sit back and recognize that if we're going to, we're going to treat people authentically and like people, we have to realize they're human. We're not much different than these people that we're trying to get in touch with, right? The last bullet point for all of you that are here today and have graciously come and joined me. And then we're going to jump into some like, I don't know if we got Q&A or anything lined up, but if you guys have questions that are coming up right now in your head, please fill some stuff out, put some stuff in the chat. And after we get to this last bullet point, I'd love to just talk to all of you and give some very, very, very pointed advice around things you need help with. The, the final piece of this puzzle is undeniable curiosity, creating undeniable curiosity and giving better experiences, which is basically sums this whole thing up, right? There's a big difference between being curious, instilling curiosity, and faking curiosity. <laughs> Right. There, there, it's, it's the concept of like asking somebody how their day is as if somehow you care or, or right. Do you? That's the question I always ask people. Does it matter to you? Or do you use that because it, because you've been told by a sales guru, not me, not the gazelle. You've been told that by saying that it lightens the mood. But it doesn't. If my, if you called me, right after some tragic thing happened in my life or when I lost my father to cancer in 2016, they were like, hey, how are you? I literally would hate that phone call. <laughs> and in most cases, most of our lives are, are filled with stress, anxiety, problems, trouble. And here you are asking somebody how they are. Most likely their response to you is a lie. So why set that up in the first place? That's just continuing to build on the stereotype of sales, right? Stay away from faking curiosity. And just be different with people. That's how we have to think about this. Um, hey guys, too, just real quick, if somebody wants to come on video with me, uh, we're gonna we're in like two more minutes, and then we're gonna start taking questions. Somebody wants to come on video with me, say that you want to come on video, and we'll bring you up here, and you can ask your question to me live, and we can spitball and banter back and forth. the The side of that that that's important is. The simple psychology of curiosity, okay? Think about this for a second. The study of the brain, it, it, it's such a fascinating thing. Any of you that, that are in sales or in marketing that have not taken some type of psychology course, do it. My wife has a five-year degree and she has certificates in criminal psych and she was a neuropsychometrist. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to my sales career is my wife choosing to go into that industry because the simple psychology of curiosity is that humans are naturally curious. If you're walking down the street and there's a hundred dollar bill sitting on the sidewalk in front of you, it's not that you need that hundred dollar bill in that moment. It's that you're curious as to why is this sitting here and can I have it? It's the same thing when a salesperson calls you and instills that curiosity into you in that moment. Should I take this call actually? Because I, sh I will fear missing out otherwise. That's what curiosity creates. It's such a powerful tool that everybody has to think about. Okay, please apply this, these concepts accordingly. 
and effectively and with excellence. Okay, because this provides clarity for people. Because no one likes a sales call. <laughs> None of your buyers enjoy getting a sales call, right? But if we can create clarity in those moments that I'm a human looking to be authentic with you and to build something that no other salesperson has, because I want a career, I want a legacy, I want a lifestyle. I don't just want to be here for a couple of years, and then move on to the next, sell something else. I want something bigger for myself. And because of that, I want to impact you. When we can relay that, we bring joy back to the sales cycle. If anybody has any questions that they want to come on screen and talk to me about, hey, let's get Laura Beth Hunley on screen, Savannah. Uh, too bad if you don't want to come on screen, Laura Beth. Come on. Not too bad, but please. <laughs> let's get her up here. I want her to ask this question live. She says, okay, let's bring her up. Uh, Paul, hey, great question to Paul while we work on bringing Laura Beth up here. Uh, and it's Laura Beth Hunley, Savannah. Um, Paul, uh, bro, there's only one, like one of the things that I'll say about books is that um, I'm unpopular opinion here and or like person here. Like I don't read a lot of books, y'all. Like I do read books that are like Star Wars and Harry Potter, uh, but I stopped reading sales books a long time ago. Now I just like let other people read them to me. Uh, but Og Mandino, the greatest salesperson on earth, is the best sales book that you'll ever read in your entire life. And I would, I would absolutely recommend that, especially to Paul and his question. The second book that the only other book I ever recommend that's a sales book is my guy Stu Heinick. You, you, you spell his name a little bit uh, different than you pronounce it. H-E-I-N-C-K-E. -E, uh, E-C-K-E. Um, Stu Heinick is an amazing human being that created a book called How to Get a Meeting with Anyone. And it's one of my favorite AVM books in the entire world. And it changed my life. So Og Mandino, that's OG Mandino, the greatest person, salesperson to ever walk the earth. And the second is Stu Heineck, uh, How to Get a Meeting with Anybody. What's up, Lord Beth? Hi. How's it going? I've been trying to talk to you for two years. This is a very exciting <laughs> moment in time for me. That's um, awesome. So my question is, you know, I, I'm a hundred percent remote and I have been even before COVID, like it's very unlikely that I will ever in person meet any of my prospects, uh, unless maybe they become clients and maybe I'll get to go. I don't know. Like, I just don't know. So I love, I love all your in-person stuff. Like those are things that I would have done when I was, you know, repping yellow book ads 15 years ago. But now I don't have the chance to do that. So I'm just wondering in the digital age, you know, how you can kind of take those things and move them over. Fantastic question. Uh, so even back in the days when I was selling copiers, um, I should mention this story. I actually sold to a group out of New Orleans, Louisiana. They were a hotel management chain. Uh, they had like 30 odd hotels and they were big and I wanted them. And even though there was a hotel in my territory, they couldn't make decisions until I had a good relationship with the guys in New Orleans. So I couldn't be there on site. And this is 2012. So like doing things remote or virtually, it's very difficult. That like back then, that's when they had like, there was like one platform period to like do meetings. And I can't like, I can't even think of the name. It's like the worst one. <laughs> that's out there though. Like today, when you see someone running a meeting with it, you're like, yo, get me away from this. This is like, WebEx. <laughs> What's up, Jason? That's it, dude. WebEx. There's one other one too. I think it's like go to meeting, but, but WebEx, that's it. Throwback. So I actually, what I did is like, here's the first thing that I did actually, is I learned a lot about those, those gentlemen. I made phone calls to people that knew them and I built credibility through like understanding their culture, their leadership styles, and then what I did is I started sequencing gifting. Um, another good book uh, with that said would be John Rulin, Giftology. That's a good book to read for sure. I love that guy. I think he's a genius as well. And so I started gifting these people sequenced things. So imagine that you send the letter campaign, right? Because I can tell you what I, I sent these guys, but imagine that you use the letter campaign and that your messaging is very, it's not just familiar to like a bad sales call and how it ends up with the trash, but it also has elements of those people, their personalities, their culture, their leadership style, the things that they want to accomplish as a company. 
right? Imagine that we're also like instilling those things into people through that concept. Uh, so what you want to think about is less that you're remote and more about like, how do I become present for these people? So we're, mm -hmm. we're doing a lunch right now for a group um, in a state that I won't mention just in case they're here and they get my lunch and they're like, ah, you talked about this. They're going to say that anyway. Uh, but we're, we're having like a local restaurant, like feed these people, right? Because we want them to understand that like we understand their, their local community and the culture of their local community, the things that are popular, Right. I think there was even a comment made that like it's it's expensive to get lunch from there. That's because it's the best place. Right. That's because everybody wants to go there. It's the oldest. Right. It's where everybody's grandparents ate. Right. So like if you can create the, that tie in and you can have messaging with that as well, not just like here's some lunch. Right. But the message is powerful. It's all about the message. When we can help people to understand that, like we get it. We get who it is that that you serve. We get who, what it is that you're trying to build from a legacy perspective. We get why it's difficult for you to trust me, an outside vendor in another state, yeah, selling right. a product, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's just, uh, and even to like, you know, you mentioned the thing about the people that say, oh, I don't have time. I mean, I, I, uh, I've been cold calling my face off these days. And, you know, I, I love that after 20 plus years in, years in sales, people are still hanging up on me. Like, I, you know, but you're right. You can't take it personal, although sometimes it does make me a little fired up, but um, you know, you don't have time to talk to me, click. Yeah. It'd be cool to send them a commit calendar, but do you work from home? Are you in your office? Do you, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a challenge, right? So to differentiate yourself, I think is, is a little more difficult, but I, I love the concept of doing the research around the individual. Um, I think that's really great advice. Yeah. And really what I would, what I would tell, what I would tell you is to, to use something like our letter campaign It's a very, it's a nominal cost to you and you can make your own just like I take the ideas. I just you haven't been it. able to put it into practice. Girl, let's go. You've already got yeah. it. Message me on the Rebel Slack uh and Jeremiah, both of us together. We'll help you kick that thing off. We'll help okay. you get we'll help you do everything you need to do in order to start. Because here's what happens is uh for example like here this is right out of one of our rebel squadrons. Uh, this is one of our students. He says, yo, cold calls are fun this morning. I've gotten more laughs from folks plus real conversations. Right. This is a guy that has to make 33 dials a day, no matter what minimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can still make those dials and have fun doing this. And then you can incorporate your letter campaign on top of it, mm -hmm. which like, let's say every five dials is somebody that's gotten a letter, but not all 33 people that you're calling that day. Right. It's like nuancing just small little steps for yourself in mm -hmm. order to start to create more impact. And like, let's say it sets you two more appointments a week. Right, that's massive to it's what huge. to what yeah, it is that you're currently doing, no matter who you are, no matter what your quota is. Because yeah. if you can then nuance that into it being consistent every week, then you're you're in those places that you desire to be from a legacy standpoint. Amazing. Thank you. Hit us up on the Slack. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I will. Thanks. You rock. We got anybody else in here, Savannah, that wants to jump up? Let's see if we got I think we got two more questions. Now we got one more. Nick. Should I do in my sales process as I'm not that experienced? I don't have any scripts or structure. Nick, what's up, my guy? Hopefully you're new to sales. Congratulations, if that's the case. I think a sales process uh, starts with an inner connection or uh, internal connection with ourselves around why we're doing this first. I think the first thing that you want to ask yourself is not so much like it's okay that you're not experienced, right? I want you to ask yourself instead, I want you to ask yourself like, why am I going to be the best salesperson in my bullpen in the world selling my product, right? The black mama mindset, Kobe Bryant, read his book too, y'all. See, I told you I don't read a lot of sales books, but I read a lot of other books. <laughs> so, so Nick, I would tell you that from the sales process perspective, you need to break it up into segments. You need to say, what are the things that I need to learn that are most important? So if I'm doing cold outreach through email or phone call, or if I'm doing in person, I need to say, all right, instead of saying, the reason I do that is to set an appointment to get somebody on a demo, unless I'm doing it myself, I'm a full cycle sales rep, yada, 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 right? Instead of doing that, start with the micro of saying, well, why am I doing, why am I prospecting in the first place? Not like, what does it lead to, but why am I, why am I doing it to begin with? And what will differentiate me inside of my marketplace? How can I brand myself essentially through the words I use, through the message that I carry, Right, and get people to buy in through 
uh, not through the value, the intrinsic and extrinsic value, right? No convincing, right? Just influence people. Let people buy into what it is that you're doing. Like start there with like that one topic. And really like, I always like the idea of reverse engineering that instead of going like starting here and saying, here's all the pieces of the sales process. I always like get into the end result. The end result is that you want someone to have a good experience with you, Nick. You don't need to sell to everybody, but you want to get everybody to the end of this thing and to say, Nick, you're awesome. I'm grateful that you ever showed up. Uh, we're not going to use your company, unfortunately, but you can stay in touch with me. Or somebody says, Nick, sign in the paperwork, right? Those are the two best outcomes you could possibly get from anybody and everybody, right? And, and so we take those two best outcomes and we say, cool, how do I get to those, right? And saying either you win or you lose, that to me is not legendary, right? When we lose, we want to we want it to be hard for people to tell us no in the first place. We want it to kind of hurt when they can't do business with us because of the trust and credibility and the likability, if if that's possible, Nick, right? Remember, not everybody has to like you, that you've developed and created with these people. It's all about the experience that we give. So if we, if we head there and we say, well, this is what I want to produce, and we come back to just the simple step of prospecting, Nick, and we say, and we say to ourselves then, like, well, cool, how do I create the experience that nuances that emotion and that outcome? throughout my process and never deviates from that. From there, you can start to look at other pieces of the sales cycle. But dude, you don't need to know anything other than what it is that you fix for people, the problems that are consistent for those people, and what, what it is that they desire for their business, right? I didn't know jack about copy machines and I was walking into places you know, selling copiers. Instead, I got everybody else to tell me everything possible. And people say all the time, they go, well, what happens when they say something that doesn't make sense or you don't know the answer to bro just ask them why they freaking ask the question <laughs> hey i love that question could i could you tell me like are you experiencing something like that right now so a reason why you asked outside of just wanting to know the answer from you know the perspective of my company and what we do yeah dude the company we do, we have now lied and they told us that they did all these things and it's never done that <laughs> okay well it sounds like we have more to fix than just this one tiny issue in that case, right? And you can keep those conversations and dialogue and that dialogue rolling for a very long time. To me, your process is created around that experience. You need to gain the experience, right? Because you said it best. I don't have a lot of experience. Well, it's not about you know knowing the product. When you think about experience, bro, it's about knowing thy customer more so than anything else. I hope that helps you, Nick. Um, let's see here. I'm going to take one more real quick. God. Is there a good resource you recommend to finally mailing addresses to send letters or gifts to since so many people are working from home? Um, let's see here. I got a couple. Lead IQ is the first. Get up anybody over at Lead IQ. If you come to the Rebel Slack, salesrebellion.com, top right hand corner, it says community. Click there. You can join our Rebel Slack for free. Jeremy is in there. You can talk to anybody from Lead IQ directly on their website as well, too. Um, other resources, like there's people like postal.io. Um, there's other companies, right. That, that essentially there's reach desk that they like, they'll send stuff for you. I don't know that they'll necessarily provide you addresses, Daniel. So I'm not sure about that side of it, but, but really like, to be honest with you, the best way you want to know the best way to find an address, ask the customer. <laughs> so the most elite rebels that are making the most money and, and providing the most fulfillment for themselves are asking. They're sending emails going, hey, I have something for you. Is this the right address? And I'm telling you right now, Daniel, it's crazy, right? They're getting responses because it's so raw. It's so real. They're getting responses like, what are you sending? Or this is my address. What is it? Right. And, and listen, you can, you can have fun with those responses just as much. You just have to, you have to say to yourself, do I want to become a legend inside of sales or do I just want to like do my job and get by? Right. Cause in those moments we have this unique opportunity to give people very specific experiences, whether they roll their eyes or they say, yes, we have ignited an emotional outcome. <laughs> and so we now exist on their radar. So, so have fun and ask people for their addresses more so than trying to find lists. Cause here's the other thing is like, let's say you spend 500 bucks on a list and all the addresses are wrong. You're not getting your money back. I promise you. <laughs> Don't make the same mistakes that so many of us have in the past, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we got a minute left. 
I just want to say a sh- huge shout out to my wife for 15 years of marriage, 19 years of putting up with me as her boyfriend, um, and to my beautiful son who she's hanging out with back in Tennessee while I'm out in California getting work done. Hey, baby, I'll see you Saturday night. Uh, we're going to do some awesome stuff. I hope that you logged into this today like I asked you to. Um, and if you got it on mute in the background somewhere, that's cool too. I love you. I appreciate you. And to everybody that's here today, thank you so much for your time. I believe that time is the most important thing that we can give to one another. And so I'm extremely grateful to all of you for it. To Savannah, uh, to the group at Sales Hacker, I love you all, especially you, Colin Kimball. You're You are my bestie in the sales, sales world, my guy. Again, thank you all. If you want to come and hang out in the Rebel Slack, feel free to. We'd love to host you over there, help you learn more about these concepts and what it is that we're doing to bring joy back to sales. Thank you to Eric Hall for sponsoring this. I love you all. Peace.